During the Ice Age, mastodons roamed through New York over what are today some of the most well-known streets of the city, streets where evidence of their influence can still be found. We're here on Fifth Avenue. We're looking south this way. And you've got Rockefeller Center to your right here and St. Patrick's on the left. And we're looking at these honey locust trees. If you look across here, you'll see a, a large thorn sticking out of the tree. And they can grow up to like two feet long. Now, if they're not trimmed off, these things will be poking, bristling out in large numbers. So you'd, you'd end up with a very heavily armored tree. You wouldn't want to get close to that thing. Experts believe that the trees evolved these protective spines thousands of years ago to guard against New York's largest Ice Age residents. These marshy forests dotted with shallow lakes and ponds a perfect habitat for the American mastodon. This creature stands three meters tall at the shoulder, slightly shorter than the African elephant. It weighs seven and a quarter tons and wields two and a half meter long tusks. But unlike their cousins, the woolly mammoths, these beasts prefer wetlands to the dry prairie. Mastodons really like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut. They liked uh, the cold, wet forest. They were at home there, and they're often found in bogs that formed around wet forests. If you go further north and further west, in the Ice Age, it was drier, more open, grasslands. That's where you get the woolly mammoth. You do find the two together on occasion, the mastodon and the mammoth. But they're really fundamentally different kinds of hairy monster. The mastodon has a larger skull and is more muscular than the mammoth. But what really sets these two creatures apart can be found inside their mouths. If you go to a great fossil hall, you see two Ice Age monsters that look like elephants. But open their jaws, which you should do, and look at their teeth, stick your fingers in there. You have a few coarse, mountain-shaped cusps that look like a giant human molar cusp. And it makes it very distinct. Mammoth and elephant both have very flat grinders, flat surfaces, much more adapted for eating grasses. Mastodon teeth have these great lumpy cusps for crushing branches, thick branches. A mammoth can't do that. Totally different style of chewing, same body plan. Mastodon with human-type teeth, mammoth with elephant teeth. Fossil evidence of New York's mastodons has been unearthed in and around the city, including a tusk and a jawbone and teeth found at two sites off of Broadway in Manhattan, right near Inwood Hill Park. This is a tooth from the mouth of a real native New York monster. If you're gonna find anything from a mastodon, if it's nothing else, it's likely to be a molar, because these are the most enduring parts of the skeleton. But travel back again 12,000 years ago. A rodent much heavier than a rat plagues those hidden corners of New York. The city is overrun with giant beavers called Castoroides. Beavers are an old, old family. Most beavers are medium sized, big one, 20 pounds. There was a giant beaver, Castoroides, which has a head as big as a black bear and would weigh up to 150 pounds. And they're here in New York. Castoroides has an impressive tail of over half a meter long, apt for one of the largest rodents ever to walk the earth. The 15 centimeter incisors poking out of the front of its mouth help it to clip and chew lakeside greens. And like his modern day beaver cousins, his broad teeth seem capable of cutting down trees. Everyone wonders, did they cut down trees? Would any tree be safe with a beaver as big as a Buick? 
We don't know. No one has found a giant Ice Age fossilized beaver lodge, not yet. They could have eaten bark and vegetation without felling the trees. No matter how Castoroides uses those teeth, it's not a meat eater. With Arctodus nearby, the giant beaver stays near the water where its expert swimming skills keep it out of harm's way. For almost one million years, the monstrous short-faced bear stalked the North American continent. On all fours, it was six feet tall, yet it could outrun a horse. It was twice the size and much more powerful than a grizzly bear. Dr. Matthews lays out three bear skulls that tell a striking story. Well, what you're looking at here is a skull of the giant short-faced bear. Here's a skull of a fairly good-sized grizzly bear, and this is a black bear. The short-faced bear would have been about uh, 1,200 pounds. This grizzly would have been about 500, 600 pounds, and this black bear, 200 or 250 pounds. Walking on all fours, a grizzly bear is about three and a half feet tall. The short-faced bear was six feet tall. And when it stood up, this huge creature measured 11 feet. Even amongst other monsters, it stood out. A short-faced bear is quite a bit larger, two to three times the size of a grizzly bear we'd see today. And the question always is why? Why such large size? Why did this bear evolve to be such a giant? Scientists theorize that the size of this bear made it a fearless hunter, able to kill very large prey unavailable to other predators. One such prey animal was the Jefferson ground sloth, an herbivore that weighed in at 2,000 pounds. Although slow moving, its massive size was protection against smaller predators like the saber-toothed cat or dire wolf. Like today's elephants on the African plains, the sloth's massive size made it difficult to kill. If a sloth was attacked by a short-faced bear, it would use its best defense, sheer bulk. You can visualize the sloth rising up on its hind legs to make itself appear bigger and more impressive to chase off a predator. The sloth outweighed the bear by more than 800 pounds. But once the bear stood up, they were nearly the same height. I can see these two animals rearing up, and you would have like a boxing match where they're both up there, they're swinging at each other. In terms of weaponry, this bear had a pretty amazing arsenal. Imagine the reach of these long legs and sharp claws. It would be like a boxer standing up with a super long reach. According to Greg McDonald, the sloth's best defense was to inflict damage with its long, sharp claws. The bear might be able to immobilize its prey by either slashing open their abdominal area or by crushing the sloth's shoulder with his powerful bite. When you think of how powerful its jaw was, it would have created a lot of force that could certainly, if it got a hold of an animal's limb, would break it very quickly with the, with the jaw muscles. With his shoulder broken, the sloth would be defenseless. When comparing the short-faced bear's gait to the grizzly, calculations show that the short-faced bear was slightly faster, reaching a top speed of 32 miles per hour but the grizzly could accelerate from zero to 30 much quicker. This put the short-faced bear at a huge disadvantage when it came to hunting. If it was a super predator like the isotope tests showed, it would have to catch prey using bursts of speed like a lion. But the bear's bone structure wasn't designed for that. It became clear that the bear couldn't chase down its kill because its long legs were not suited to make sharp turns at high speeds. We're standing in front of a reconstruction of an adult giant short-faced bear, and the main thing that stands out are these super long legs that are also very skinny. For an animal this size, these bones are very gracile or 
thin. Their, their diameter is not proportioned to their length for an animal that is incurring all the dynamic stresses and strains of fast running. Yet we know this bear apparently caught and ate just about everything. But its long leg bones were not strong enough to handle the dynamic force of the bear's 1,200 pound weight. Using a modern day leg bone, Dr. Matthews illustrates why it couldn't maneuver in for the kill. This is a tibia from a large mammal, and I'm gonna demonstrate the effect of uh, dynamic stress on it. This is a five pound bag of sand, and you can see that the bone is able to support the weight of that bag all on its own. But watch what happens when we put the weight in motion, which is the effect of an animal running. So what happens with five pounds of weight when it's in motion is it becomes something more like 100 pounds of weight. And this bone isn't strong enough to handle that weight. This simulates the effect on a bone when it slams into the ground during a high-speed chase. The short-faced bear could only chase an animal like a horse in a straight line. If the horse made a sharp turn and the bear followed, it could break its leg. So when you start to piece together bits of evidence like this, uh, you start to see a different picture of this animal. What you see is an animal that's very large, it's very lanky, that can travel at moderate speeds for a long time. Dr. Matthews believes he has solved this ancient mystery. The short-faced bear evolved into its massive size not for hunting, but for intimidating other animals into giving up their hard-earned prey. Far from the ultimate predator, the bear was instead the ultimate scavenger, roaming vast areas in search of a free meal. But what happened when the bear was late for dinner? This is where the bear's short face came in most handy. Because its front teeth were so close to the fulcrum of its jaw, the bear's bite could crack open bones. Imagine this pliers is a face, like a jaw, going up and down. And this is the fulcrum of the lever system. If you picture the anterior teeth trying to bite bone or anything else, you can see that there's not very much power in that bite. The anterior teeth aren't very strong. I'm trying to squeeze that very hard and I'm having no effect on that bone. Now, if we put it back closer to the fulcrum, we're going to see that there's much more power in that bite. The bear's short face gave its jaw the ability to crack open very large bones and access nutritious marrow cavities that contained fats, lipids, and extra calories. There is a large collection of 10,000-year-old bones that testify to the bear's skill as a scavenger. This is a very large bison bone from the Pleistocene. It was a large male. And this is the size bone that only a short-faced bear could have opened up. It is a name that conjures up ferocity and defines the word predator saber tooth a huge cat which specialized in killing the very biggest prey. Immensely powerful, sporting seven inch long knife sharp canines. For nearly two million years, this monstrous beast dominated the primal landscape of the Americas. Massively built, Smilodon may have weighed up to 750 pounds, 25% more than the biggest male lion and it carried some serious weaponry. Its short bobtail means it was not much of a runner. Modern cats, even big ones like lions, use their long tails for balance and turning during high-speed pursuit. Smilodon just didn't have that capability because of the shortness of its tail. This animal obviously was doing something completely different from modern feline cat. If Smilodon wasn't chasing fast-running prey, then it had to have been targeting slower, bigger animals. They would have had to use stealth to get close, and then launch a short-range deadly attack. And the bones bear that out. 
Sabretooth had oversized front paws with big thumb claws, which scientists believe were for the specific purpose of grappling with extra large prey. It was a wrestler, not a runner. It was an ambush predator with really short legs and somewhat flat feet. And it was designed to get a hold of its prey, grapple with it, and actually hold it immobile while it was stabbing it. Ever since the first perfectly preserved saber-tooth remains were excavated from the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles in 1875, scientists have been trying to figure out exactly how Smilodon used their supersized canines. In spite of a weak bite, we know they were eating big animals like bison, even mammoths and sloths. So presumably, Smilodon's knife-like teeth were a special adaptation for killing their mega prey. The modern lion's much more massive skull with its powerful jaw is clearly designed to deliver a very different kind of killing bite than saber tooths. The African lion has these canine teeth that are relatively round in cross section. They're really peg-like by uh, comparison with these knives that are coming out of the front of the jaws of this animal. So the sabers are extremely long. They're very narrow from side to side. They're fairly broad from front to back. But these knives clearly had some limitations. The sabers were strong in the forward-backward direction, but relatively weak and brittle when subjected to side-to-side -to -side motion. And that weakness means there were some real limits to where Sabretooth could bite its victims. If it got its canines caught up in the bones of struggling prey, Smilodon was likely to lose a tooth. I don't think an attack along the spine of the prey would have made sense for Smilodon because they had those enormous sabers, they're very delicate, and risk of breakage is high for those saber teeth if they impact something hard, especially from the side. So if they leap onto the back of an animal and then sink their teeth in, one of their teeth at least is likely to run into a vertebrae and it would snap. A Smilodon saber teeth were no accident of nature. They looked that way for a lethal reason. But weapons cannot work without tactics, and the Smilodon's killing techniques are still a mystery. It was the largest wolf ever to walk the earth fierce, powerful, and tenacious predator. The dire wolf killed to survive in a savage Ice Age world. Hunting in packs, the dire wolf was one of the most imposing predators on the Pleistocene landscape. The packs of wolves methodically orchestrated kill after kill. The wolf averaged five feet from nose to tail, stood just over two feet tall, and weighed up to 150 pounds. In Latin, it's called Canis dirus, but it's better known as the dire wolf. The name dire is fitting. The name evokes a menacing predator looming on the horizon. It is by far the most common species to be found at the La Brea excavations. More than 3,500 individual wolves have been uncovered. By comparison, there are just 2,000 saber-tooth cats. Experts believe the large number of dire wolf bones proves they were social animals, perhaps running in packs of 30 or more. They also suggest the dire wolf had a special talent for survival. Compare 3,500 dire wolves to just 15 of their closest Ice Age relatives, the gray wolf. The dire wolf had been dominating the gray for hundreds of thousands of years when the dire wolf suddenly disappeared. Yet it was the gray wolf that survived. The anatomy of the two species reveals why. Anatomy is often destiny. and Anatomy often tells a story about what actually worked for an animal or for a species for a long time. And the anatomy of the Pleistocene mammals gives us very good pictures of Pleistocene behaviors. At first glance, 
the anatomy of the two animals is nearly identical, suggesting they acted much the same. But when we take a closer look, we find small but crucial differences between the two. The most distinctive difference is the dire wolf's larger jaw and teeth. Paleontologists believe this would have created a much stronger bite, adapted to bring down the larger Ice Age mammals like bison and horse. Researchers compared other bones and discovered other important differences between the two species. The humerus, or upper arm bone, of the dire wolf, for example, is slightly longer, but significantly thicker than that of the gray. So too is the ulna, or one of the two lower arm bones of the dire wolf. That means the dire wolf was a more powerfully built animal, weighing up to 70 pounds more than the gray wolf. The lighter gray wolf bones suggest it was sleeker and probably more fleet of foot. These differences are subtle but significant and likely transform these similar creatures into very different hunters. Its powerful build and massive jaw and teeth indicate it feasted on the largest of prey, like the mammoth or bison. Unfortunately for the wolf, the rules of nature favor the larger species. In a one-on-one -on -one encounter, the short-faced bear or saber-toothed cat would overwhelm the wolf. Individually, the dire wolf was no match against a saber-toothed cat. It would likely turn tail and run before taking it on. But as a member of a pack, it became a commanding presence and would have fought to protect its territory. With its superiority of numbers, the pack would have surrounded a solitary cat, constantly harassing it from all sides. They're most likely in concert in, in a very threatening type of posturing way. A single Smilodon can't be looking everywhere at once. And even though they're all smaller than you, the numbers and the proximity is probably going to suggest that there's some fights that are just not worth having. The cat would eventually break off the attack and search for a meal somewhere else. But there was another dangerous predator who appeared on the landscape. Human beings. These creatures had the skills not only to hunt mammoths, but intelligence enough to kill almost any animal. Scientists are still investigating the relationship between humans and the short-faced bear. Dr. Eileen Johnson is the director of the Lubbock Lake Landmark in Texas. She's renowned for analyzing alterations to bone surfaces. She's been examining some short-faced bear bones that were butchered by humans. It is the only evidence we have of human-bear contact. I've looked at all the bear remains that we have, and particularly the kinds of cut marks that are on the bone. And that leads me to uh, believe that that this was not a fresh carcass. This carcass had already started to stiffen a bit, which would indicate a found carcass, which then indicates scavenging activities. Dr. Johnson feels the bear wasn't killed by humans. This is the, the canine from the bear, uh, but it's very worn down. So this is most likely a very old bear, probably died from natural causes. Ironically, it seems the humans may have found the bear carcass and then scavenged it. The hunters cut off one of the bear's long front legs and made a butchering tool out of its radius, or lower arm bone. Dr. Johnson was able to reconstruct how the bone was broken. The hunters laid it between two rocks that were like anvils. Then a hammer stone was used to break the bone. And it delivers a very quick, very focused force, uh, get a nice impact, and then the bone breaks in a very particular fashion known as a helical fracture. Since humans only had a few small stone tools, this was an ingenious and efficient way for them to butcher the giant bear or any other large animal, such as a mammoth. The broken edge of the bone provided a sharp and strong cutting tool that got the job done quickly. When the hunters were done butchering, they discarded the bone so they didn't have to carry around a lot of heavy tools. 
they would just make new tools at the next kill site. So it would lighten their load, it would limit the need to have a, an extended uh, tool kit. But hunters did carry one item that was essential for survival, the Clovis Point. This was a stone weapon that was one of the first technologies invented by humankind. It was discovered in 1932 next to a dead mammoth in Clovis, New Mexico. Later, scientists were able to carbon date the mammoth bones, estimating the age of the spearhead as 13,500 years old. The Clovis point was such an important hunting tool that anthropologists dubbed the prehistoric Native American culture who used it Clovis people. These hunters specialized in taking down mammoths, and they were very good at it. Paleontologists discovered one site in southern Arizona where at least nine mammoths had been killed. But butchering a massive mammoth carcass would attract unwanted attention from a creature used to taking any carcass it found. If he smells a fresh kill, he's going to go for it. If there's a few funny-looking people around, that's not going to intimidate him. He's going to try to intimidate them usually by standing up and giving a display of his size. But while the humans couldn't match the bear's strength, they did carry a lethal weapon that could protect them from any fierce predator. The atlatl dart, armed with a Clovis point. The atlatl was humankind's first mechanical invention. It was a stick with a hook or socket that a hunter used to launch a light spear armed with a Clovis point. This is a replica Clovis point. It's very sharp, and with a lot of power behind it, it's easily going to penetrate the bear's skin. When thrown properly, an atlatl dart traveled at 100 miles per hour and was very accurate at close range. Still, Dr. Agenbrod feels it would have to be a very lucky shot. The hunters would have to aim for the vital organs that offered the most vulnerable target. Behind the bear's rib cage were its lungs, heart, and liver. You don't want to try hitting this animal in the head. You're going to be bear food if you do that. But who would have won this fight? In my opinion, Clovis people were very intelligent. They're using the very best tool material. They've invented a spear point that is a killing machine and we're going to try to dispatch him. You don't want to be in direct competition with this bear because you're going to lose. These are people who are trained from their youngest time. They're trained with their weapons, so I think that they are capable of defending themselves. <laughs> 